Well, I think Thor resonates more now with uh, with uh, the, the Ragnarok movie um, that we did, and also now with Love and Thunder because we're giving him more human problems, more relatable problems. Um, you know, let's face it. You can't really relate to a space Viking who's thousands of years old and uh, is basically a zillionaire who lives in space. Uh, so you've got to give these characters uh, things that we've all experienced. And and in this film, I think uh, we can relate to him more than ever, where he's lost, he's trying to find purpose, and uh, he luckily, by the end of the film, uh, he finds that purpose. My approach to Thor was to create a film that's fun and energetic and adventurous, but also emotional. And I really wanted to concentrate on this idea of love and what love means to Thor. And, you know, and whether or not that's the thing he's searching for, is this idea of, of loving someone and being loved. So we find Thor in a very reflective, meditative um, position at the beginning of the film. He's trying to find himself. He's, uh, he's looking internally. He's doing a lot of searching, like a lot of us do when you know, we feel lost. We suddenly turn to um, crystals and meditation to try and figure our stuff out. And uh, it's the same with Thor in this. He, you know, we wanted to create this idea that he's going through a midlife crisis. And you know, he's, after years of saving planets and saving other people, he hasn't really left anything for himself. And it's about him finding the, the way to, to find purpose. Uh, so Natalie Portman is now back in the MCU, she's back in the Thor franchise and in a bigger, better, bolder way and it's, it's extremely exciting because she's now the mighty Thor, um, she's no longer Thor's girlfriend, the scientist in Albuquerque, she's now the mighty Thor who has the hammer and she's got the cape and the armor and she can fly and she can She's wielding Mjolnir and she can harness lightning. I mean, she's an incredible character, super strong, and it's great to see Natalie. It's great to see a, a female superhero all the time. It's great, and but see one so powerful and and really dominating a lot of the the storyline and really being a you know an equal presence with uh, Thor is a great thing to see. Yeah. So when Thor. When Thor, and Val, when, when Thor and Jane meet after years of being apart and years of not talking, um, she's on the battlefield and she's dressed as the mighty Thor and she's got her powers and she's doing amazing things with the hammer. She can wield the hammer in a way that Thor never could. And Thor's reaction, uh, apart from the surprise and the shock at seeing someone holding his hammer, is really more um, focused on that's his ex-girlfriend and he hasn't seen her for a long time and maybe this is the thing he's been looking for to fill that hole in his life, the thing that might give him purpose. The villain in this film is played by Christian Bale and the villain's name is Gore the God Butcher. And he comes from a run of comics uh, from uh, Marvel, from uh, uh, it's called the God Butcher. Oh, wait, the character is called the God Butcher, and he—he's probably one of the more sympathetic villains that uh, they've had in the MCU, and he's very um, formidable. And he's—I mean, essentially, he's—you uh, know—he's he, a very scary. He might be the scariest villain they've had. Um, but he's sympathetic because he's dealing with uh, issues that, and without giving it away, you understand where his anger and his drive comes from. Tessa Thompson is back as Valkyrie, and she's now King Valkyrie. She's ruling over New Asgard in Norway, and you know, they're making their best uh, attempts to integrate into Earth society and they've made a little tourism uh, town out of, uh, out of that little part of Norway and they've got a thriving industry and Valkyrie is overseeing all of this. She's got new responsibilities. However, she's also a career soldier. You know, she's a professional fighter and 
that's really the life that she's used to. And so she's now in a bureaucratic position where she's just doing you know, a lot of admin and a lot of uh, uh, meeting a lot of delegates from other countries and stuff and business meetings. And, and for her, you know, it's really cool to see the character like that. He's dealing with this stuff and being very responsible for, you know, for the first time in a long time. But also still, you know, her heart is in the battle and going on adventures. And then she uh, does get to go on the adventure. Korg is, um, Korg is a, a fantastic character in the film. He's uh, made of rocks and he's played by one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with, uh, Taika Waititi. And, um, well, what can I say about Taika as an actor? You know, he's uh, often late, doesn't learn his lines, um, so that's very frustrating. But he, he means well. And that's why I give him lots of takes to get it right. Russell Crowe, um, you know, one of the finest actors um, ever to grace the silver screen, uh, is someone that I've admired for many years. I think I've seen Master and Commando about 60 times, and uh, Gladiator probably 100. And he comes into the film playing Zeus, uh, the Greek god. I shouldn't have to explain that. Uh, but he's, um, and he's just an amazing force, an amazing presence, and you know, he's kind of like the, the overlord of all the gods. And he just brings a real sort of, uh, he just got a real like, weight to that part of the film, and, uh, and it's also fun. He's, uh, you know, it's being, it's Russell Crowe being a bit cheeky. The music in Thor Love and Thunder, um, well, it's very eclectic. And yeah, the influences that we were listening to when we were in pre-production and throughout the editing as well, it was a lot of like kind of classic 80s rock. And like, yeah, we, that's why we went straight for Guns N' Roses. And we're using a bunch of their songs. And I've loved Guns N' Roses since I was very young. And it's, uh, and it's just such an honor to be able to include their music in this film. And what, coupled with that, we have you know, an amazing score by Michael Giacchino, who did, you know, he's done a lot of the Marvel films, and um, he's you know, one of the best out there. And it just helps to create a wonderful tone that you know, switches between the emotion and also the adventure and the uh, overall over-the-topness of the story. For this film, Thor Love and Thunder, uh, we used the volume, which is uh, basically, it's a big circular room made of LED screens and you project your environments on the screen. So imagine, you know, a thousand televisions all in a big circle in the ceiling as well. And then you put an entire environment, 360 degrees. And what's great is it lights the characters and the characters, the actors themselves can see all of the stuff. They can see what the, you know, instead of a, on a green screen or a blue screen, you're asking the actors to pretend they're looking at something. And then you put that in later on. And so often they'll be looking at like a little dot on a green screen or a tennis ball on a stick. And then they ask, what is this? And you have to say, I don't know. It might be a dragon, but it also might be a flying dolphin. There are two really great, wonderful characters in the film named Tooth Nasher and Teeth Grinder. And they are gigantic goats. And they're space goats, and they are a very important part of the film because they, they drag the Viking ship that our heroes are uh, uh, on their journey on and uh, they drag it through space and so these goats come from they actually come from the original Thor mythology the Norse mythology and they also come from the comic books um, so they've been around a long time the first time in a movie 